slight short notice, but we felt like it was important to create a space and an opportunity to continue the conversation that we started um, on last Tuesday, a week ago today, regarding um, some critical updates on the One Newark plan um, that we shared. And so Peter and I are going to walk through the same information we shared at the school advisory business meeting last Tuesday and answer any questions that you may have about any of the topics in the deck. So I'm going to hand it over to Peter to dive into our presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. And again, let me also e echo Vanessa's points and welcome you all here, on, especially on short notice. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for the update. As many of you know by now, the One Newark Plan was introduced in the community last fall into the winter. And the purpose of today's presentation is to provide some update about the details of the plan. It also, however, is an opportunity to take a step back and remind us about the rationale behind the plan. The One Newark Plan in its core is, a, is, is a developing a pathway to ensure that we have 100 excellent schools serving the community of Newark. But it's also a response to four significant challenges that we always need to revisit as we talk about our planning going forward. First, fiscal challenges that are on the horizon for Newark Public Schools that if we do, were to do nothing would create, th would create even more difficult decisions going, going forward. For example, present day what we know based on student choices and family choices is that our enrollment continues to decline. As enrollment declines, those rev revenues go down as well. Going forward over the next three years, we're projecting our charter payment into the charter sector to balloon to $250 million. If we were to do nothing, the decisions we would need to make two to three years out are that much more challenging. So it's important to remember, we're faced with a scenario where we have declining enrollment that's been going on for several years. It isn't just something that started this past September. Over the last 10 to 15 years, the overall enrollment in terms of the students that Newark Public Schools serves has declined from over 50,000 to below 30, 37,000 going farther south. That's a reality that the One Newark Plan aims to address. Significant reality. Another significant challenge is the conditions of our facilities. Newark is blessed with old and beautiful buildings. That can also be a curse in terms of the upkeep required to ensure that all students across the city are being served in 21st century learning environments. What we know by recent, recent assessments is if we were to do nothing, it would do nothing at all in our buildings and just say we're going to bring them all up to 21st century learning environments, it would cost us over a billion dollars, a billion dollar investment that we just don't believe is a realistic ask right now of the community but also of the state. So we have significant issues around our facility challenges, we have declining enrollment, and there's been chronic low performance in newer public schools going back some time. Present day and over the last several administrations, for example, there is not one K-8 to school serving the South Ward that has more than 30% of their students on average achieving proficiency in language arts. Think about that. An entire community in the city over several administrations lacks even one school that is breaking the 30% threshold of proficiency. This is why families are choosing with their feet and choosing options outside of certain communities. The One Newark, the One Newark Plan at its core is a, is a strategy to position newer public schools to better compete and to attract those families back to those communities so that those communities can continue to thrive and we can ensure that student achievement results will increase based on the strategies outlined in the One Newark Plan. In order to achieve the plan, we've been saying consistently now for some time, there are seven bold steps that we need to take. And we're pleased to announce we've made progress on several of these. First and foremost, last fall, we introduced into the community family snapshots across traditional public schools and charter schools. For the first time in the city, families could look at one metrics to, to evaluate the performance of a school, whether it was a charter school, whether it was a newer public school. We needed to have a common framework for talking about success in the city and not have one that served just the charter sector and one that served just the traditional public school sector. 
This is now launched, and we'll continue to revise this going forward. We've made great progress in this area. Second, the launch of a universal enrollment system. Pleased to say that is up and running. It's been in the community now for some time. We are coming up on the closing date, and we have upwards of 10,000 applications in place. Families are clearly engaged, and the idea of choice is not new to this community. What is new is the idea that Newark Public Schools is embracing that choice. And we're making great strides based on the numbers and the numbers of applications that have been completed by families to date. Third, I mentioned already the idea that we need to invest in 21st century learning environments. So the $1 billion number I referenced at the beginning of the presentation, while not realistic, doesn't mean that we've given up hope. Recently, as a result of the leadership of Superintendent Anderson, we've, we've won a $100 million um, grant from the state that goes directly to Newark Public Schools. It doesn't get funneled through the School Development Authority and gives us much more authority and accountability for how those funds will be invested in the schools. Those funds start to come online this fall and will be invested over the next three years to ensure that we are making progress on ensuring that our students are in 21st century learning environments. Fourth, we're going to talk more about the end of this presentation. And it's important to note, however, we have been referencing, referencing the need to right-size our district according to quality um, for some time now. This has been an essential part of the One Newark Plan since its launch. Um, this is not something that um, we haven't been talking about uh, with transparency in the community. As with any difficult decisions, the idea that right-sizing means we're reducing our workforce, reducing the amount of schools, New York Public Schools can continue to operate, we need to ensure we're doing that in a way that's humane and provide supports for the adults and the families and the students that are most impacted by this. One of the reasons for, making, for announcing One Newark back in the fall and winter was to begin to position our community so that we can do five well. If we waited to the spring or even later into the summer, we would not have been able to talk and have candid conversations with, with the community about what the true needs are to do five well. So it's important that this becomes more part of our conversation going forward in partnership with the community. The ward by ward strategy is very real. Present day, 37% of families in the South Ward are opting out of that ward. Not far behind is the Central and South and Central and West Wards as well. It's imperative that we bring and partner with programs that those families have been saying for some time now they want and bring those programs back to those communities. Otherwise, we're faced again with a scenario where we're in two to three years having to shutter many, many school buildings. The One Newark Plan is about preventing those decisions by making difficult decisions today. And the idea that we'll continue to grow the capacity of innovation in the district. It, for some, it might seem like a long time ago. It was only two, two, two short years ago when we launched our first Renew effort. And at the time, it was very, very, uh, very controversial. Present day, many of those renewed schools are significantly different environments than they were two years ago. The enrollment in, the, uh, the enrollment in those renewed schools is also on the rise. And we're extremely pleased with the stability of leadership and teaching, teaching force in those schools. That's the result of a commitment to innovate, as are some other strategies that we're going to talk about in the update going forward. As I mentioned, the universal enrollment uh, is closing shortly at the end of this week. We couldn't be more pleased with the number of applications submitted. Doesn't mean we're done. We're not over the finish line yet. Uh, and we're continuing to engage families on a daily basis, phone calls at every school to ensure all students that are in transition grades are completing an application. And families that indicate that they would like a different school for their, for their child are welcome to do so as well. Here, here is an overview uh, about some of the updates related to the One Newark Plan and as a result of intense community engagement over the last two months. So we initially introduced details about One Newark Plan into the community before the holidays, but then we remained engaged. Over 100 meetings were held throughout the city, a variety of different stakeholders. And as a result of those meetings and that feedback, the plan has been revised. Also, as a result of ongoing collaboration with the partners in the community, high-performing charters in particular, 
we're able to get greater detail of exactly what programs they will serve coming this fall. Specifically, here you can see at Alexander, North Star will launch a K-4 school in September. Bergaw, a team will be prepared to launch a K-4 school as well. It's important to note, all students, PK-4 to third grade in those locations, are, are able to stay in those environments and be, and be served by those programs if they so choose. In Hawthorne, we have a K-4 option that will be um, brought online in partnership with BRIC as well as team launching a K-1 school there as well. Newark Legacy's growth plan is partnered with Madison. And again, it's also important to note that the charters that are listed here are not only considered high-performing charters in the community, but their growth plans are already approved. Oftentimes, we talk about in the community that this is a, the one Newark plan is attempting to accelerate charter growth. There is no new growth decisions made here. These decisions are already approved they're coming. One Newark is a, an attempt to accelerate that growth so that we can more quickly stabilize the Newark Public Schools enrollment and budget going forward. The Newton School community, the last one just to reference here, um, because of declining enrollment and because of significant facility needs, um, we were not able to find a scenario where it made sense for Newark Public Schools to continue to operate Newton going forward. Every student and family in this school community is highly preferenced in the universal enrollment system, as are the others as well, so that they will get their first, second choice going forward. On the high school side, it's important to note there are no closings. We are not closing any high schools in the city. In fact, as a result of the feedback we've received over the last several weeks from the community, we've made some revisions to decisions. Example, the original idea in December that was announced was that we would not continue to have a ninth grade at Weequake going forward. Now we're committing for the next two years to welcome a ninth grade class into Weequake going forward. A two-year commitment and then reevaluate to ensure that there are reforms are taking place. We are also reciting Eagle and Girls Academy to Weequake. The idea being families have already demonstrated that these new programs started by newer public schools, not by charter schools, are very valuable in the community and are extremely desirable. But they weren't in the South Ward. It's an essential point of the One Newark Plan. They were in other areas of the city. We need to bring these options to the South Ward, which is the rationale behind this decision. Other details are shared here. It's worth noting in Central Office to Cedar Street, where Newark Public Schools has been housed for some time now, the decision going forward is that this is not the best location fiscally or in terms of accessibility for the community for our central office services to be located in the city. And going forward, starting this September, we'll begin to phase in our, 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 our um, offices into Newark Volk um, and ensure that uh, we have greater accessibility in the community and families can access us as need be rather than having to come downtown um, into Two Cedar Street. So it's an also an important part of the decisions that are being shared today. At this point, we're going to do a deep dive on the retaining our best teacher strategy, and I'll hand it over to Vanessa. You got it. Thank you. Sure. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so the number one factor in helping students achieve academically are their teachers. The teacher that stands in front of them makes the greatest impact on whether a student is successful in class or has um, a struggling time, right? So for us, um, retaining our best teachers at Newark Public Schools is the most important factor. We want to ensure that our best teachers are in front of our students every day. And we know currently that we have 3,200 teachers in Newark Public Schools, and last year, 20% of those teachers were rated partially effective or ineffective. So through the new framework that we instituted two years ago, we've been working with our principals, with our assistant principals, um, and together with assistant superintendents to ensure that we are um, consistently in classrooms, supporting teachers, helping them grow, but also ensuring that we understand where teachers are in terms of their development and how they're supporting students' development. So these ratings are based on that work that we've been doing over the last two years. So we 
know that we have to grapple with the budget. Currently, as, as Peter mentioned earlier, we have seven main goals in our One Newark plan. Um, the fourth of, that, of those goals, I'm gonna go back to that slide just to show you again, um, which we've been talking about since the early fall. Number four, considering quality, and that's the quality of the teacher, the effectiveness of the teacher, along with years of service while making decisions about right-sizing our workforce. What do we mean by that? So specifically what we mean is that as we look at our current fiscal crisis, as we look at the fact that there's an extreme decline in enrollment that has been happening now for decades, as Peter mentioned, we have to ensure that our staff matches the number of students that we are serving, that we have the right amount of teachers to serve the number of students that we currently have enrolled at Newark Public Schools, which means that we're facing um, an, a difficult, difficult decision to have to lay off teachers. That's a really, really hard place to be. And as we grapple with making that decision, we want to ensure that we do it by considering the quality of the teacher. We want to keep our best teachers in front of our students. We want to ensure that families get that, and they deserve that. They deserve the best teacher for their students. So as we consider laying off teachers, we have to ensure that we're doing it in a way that we feel is gonna best serve our communities and best serve our students and families. So we would like to be able to retain our best teachers. So as we're thinking about how do you go about laying off teachers, we'd like to ensure that we in have our best teachers at the forefront, which means that we would first look to um, consider looking at ineffective and partially effective teachers exiting before our effective and highly effective teachers. In order to do that, we had to apply for an equivalency, which means we seek from the commissioner an opportunity to redefine how we would implement a layoff process, meaning that it would consider both the quality of the teacher in the layoff as well as their years of service, which is new and different, but for us, we do believe it is the right thing to do and the best thing to do for our students. At this point, we have submitted the equivalency. We did this last Friday, today's Tuesday, uh, and it is at the state level at this point and there are, they are reviewing it. We are also um, looking at what we um, hope to plan for if in fact it is approved. So. We have put this information out to the community at the last school advisory business meeting. We took feedback from community members and are hoping to answer any questions that you may have about that um, equivalency application and our process. In order to support giving you more detailed information, you're gonna find on your seats a three-page overview of what was included in our application. Uh, this will give you more details around um, what our current approach is and what our approach would be if the equivalency was approved. All right, I'm gonna stop there and try to ensure that we have time for questions, both anything sure. that Peter covered or anything about the equivalency. So, questions? Uh, so what's the timeline? When do you expect to have a response um, in terms of the equivalency and then the turnaround um, to the teachers? Well, clearly we know that this is uh, a critical component to um, notifying teachers of their um, time in the district and, and what potential things they should be planning for. So we would like it to be as soon as possible. However, we need to respect that the state needs the time to review the documentation, review the application. So at this point, we really don't know when we will hear back. How, how are we defining uh, quality uh, with regards to the, the teacher quality? It's a great question. Uh, so we are looking at three parts, three components uh, to d the definition. One is their um, evaluation. So how their, their, their performance in the classroom. Uh, two is their uh, track record of attendance. 
Like, are they present? Are they a part of um, the school community on a regular basis? Are they there for their students? And three is, do they have a record around disciplinary action? Are they a teacher that's often receiving disciplinary, um, you know, meetings and, and um, follow-up? So those are the three pieces that we are using to define quality uh, and in terms of making this decision. So, and thank then you. just to add also, the quality is defined alongside seniority. Correct. So it's not that seniority isn't factored in at all. It is. If you were, for example, take the pool of ineffective teachers who may be laid off um, first in terms of order of priority, that seniority, seniority would still be considered um, alongside that. So. Um, my question is, how many teachers do you expect to be affected in total? And for teachers that were on the UPS list last year and weren't assigned to a classroom, what evaluation tool is being used for those teachers? Great questions. So. Um, and the first, the e, uh, and the second part, let's start with that one, the EWPS, uh, we are, um, we've worked really hard this year, um, and, and actually last year, last summer, we hosted a number of hiring fairs, we gave open transfer periods, we do believe in, the, in mutual consent. Mutual consent means that the principal will go out and recruit teachers and interview teachers and teachers will go out and look at schools and see if that school is a good match to them. We know uh, due to tons of research that when a teacher and a principal feel like it's a good match and there's good satisfaction there, the outcomes for students are that much greater. So we gave EWPS teachers every opportunity last year to make a match with a principal. Did that always happen? No. We, have, we do have a number of teachers who didn't find a match. And are not um, and have been in that uh, situation for more than two years. That's telling us a lot about how we need to address the quality that's, hap that's there and how do we support them. So for us, we are then creating opportunities for them to still be in classrooms. It means that we have to force place them. It's not an ideal situation. It's not what we want. We want mutual consent. But in the end, we have to force place them. They are, they are teachers. They are accountable for teaching. So we have placed them in teaching situations so that we can use the same observation tools, the same process of evaluating them as we would any other teacher in the district. And sorry, remind me of your first question again. How many teachers will be affected? Yes. Okay, so we currently have 3,200 teachers in the district. We're looking that over the next three years, we're gonna need uh, to reduce by 30%. So that would be close to 1,000 teachers that would be impacted. This is more of a clarifying question with regard to um, the open enrollment and maximizing that. You said currently we have about 10,000 applications in and we have about 36,000 students in Newark. So it's just not clear to me um, factoring those who have applied and will apply by the deadline factoring those who will choose to attend private or whatever have you, those who don't apply, the first thing is, is it mandatory that you apply via open enrollment, the application? And if it's not mandatory, those who choose not to apply, is it just default they will attend their neighborhood school or what's happening with them? And thank you for your question, the opportunity to clarify. And so first, no, it's not mandatory for all students in the district to apply. So it's important to just be very clear about that. The students that are in transition grades, so let's say, for example, Franklin School is a K-4 to four school. Uh, those fourth graders, all of those fourth graders are required to apply. Um, students in eighth grade throughout the district are required to apply. Uh, PK-4 students transitioning into kindergarten. So those are the only grades that are required to participate in universal enrollment. And then as well as other families who, are indi who have indicated a desire to have a transfer. Historically throughout the city, um, transfers and even um, regist registering at a school was always done at the school site. Um, and so essentially what we're moving towards with universal enrollment is centralizing the enrollment process across the city. Um, it's also uh, worth noting that historically, um, families with students with special needs never had a choice 
in terms of where their where their child went to school, what would happen? They would go to they would come to Two Cedar Street and they would be placed in a certain program throughout the city. They're also being encouraged to apply and participate in universal enrollment so that they can also exercise choice for the first time. Um, so I believe that I answered. I think you had a two-part question though. Ah, they stay. They stay. Yes, unless they're in one of the impacted schools, which then they would have to have applied, like in Newton I referenced earlier. Uh, but they stay. Um, so if they're pleased with what they are, they don't need, they don't need to do anything. Will um, district level teachers and non classroom teachers be affected by the waiver? And if so, what will be used to um, as the criteria? Because they don't necessarily get evaluated. All teachers, so currently all teachers in the district are being evaluated by our framework. So we will use the framework to do the evaluation and to institute this process. So that means if you're in a teacher title, all teachers who are currently using that title in that title and teaching will be evaluated in that same way. And so it's equitable. And if across. I could make a plug out there in terms of community <laughs> engagement. So if you're a teacher in the district right now and you're not getting evaluated, you need to speak up. If you're in the EWPS pool and you're not getting evaluated, you need to speak up. If you're in central office and you're not being evaluated, you need to speak up. So I wanted to deliver that message as clear mm -hmm. as we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I saw a hand back here and then I'll work my ba way back. How about that? I just had a clarifying question to um, Michelle's question. And the people who, the, so the students who are required to apply and they don't are are what happens to them so if you are like one of the students who are required to be placed uh, and you don't fill out an application do you just where do you go the the default will either be to your neighborhood geographic location um, my, my, my understanding is also though after the application closes um, and matches are made there may then be a second round right so then you can participate in the second round the reason that is not to, to anyone's advantage is because once everyone's had their first, second, third choices, you're then left with fewer opportunities, right? So it's the reason it's been so imperative, the reason we extend the deadline uh, from the middle of February to the end of February is to create more opportunity because we saw so many families accessing the universal enrollment system. Um, and so that's why these next few days are so critical. And we need all of you in this room, we need all of you who are viewing this video to communicate to, to, to members of the community that the universal enrollment system is an opportunity and they should see that they have till Friday to access it. I have two questions. The first question is on the matching that's done. How exactly is that happening? I know you can put into up to eight choices, but say there's only three schools I'm interested at all. Am I guaranteed to get into one of those three? Or is it you know first come, first serve, if we fill up this school before we get to you? Are they doing it in alphabetical order and we place the kids as we go? Like how exactly is that matching happening? So thank you for the question. First of all, it's not first come, first serve. It's important to note, so for example, if someone completes their application, while we wouldn't like this, if somebody want to wait, wants to wait till Friday, even though it will cause us great anxiety, they can. <laughs> if, if they complete that application Friday versus the person who completed their application January 15th, they're given the same priority. So no first come, first serve. The way the application is written and the way the algorithm is written is to consider eight choices. You do not, you are not, it's not to your advantage to only give three choices. It's to everyone's advantage to ensure that they take eight selections throughout that. Now, once they've, do, once they've done that, an algorithm is run, matches are made. It's important to also message into the community, this isn't the first time we've gone through this process. A year ago, the similar algorithm was used for the high school placements. And it's also important to know, if I could just for a minute, two years prior, um, it was the first time we, we went to a common application for all the magnet high schools in the city. For those who have been in the community for some time, historically the high, school the high school application process at the magnet schools was run by the schools. It was confusing, complex, and consequently 30% of families throughout the city tried to participate. Consequently, every year for generations we had seats unfilled in our best schools. That was changed two years ago through the common application process when over 75% of families participated and said, I understand now, I want, I want in. Um, so I hope I, did I answer all parts of your question?
Exactly. Well, so you would likely stay where you are, but we would ask you to please fill out the application, list your three or four options, whatever they might be, add the others, and we'll, we're hopeful that you'll get what you want. You should note, last year after the high school application process was matched, over 75% of families got their first three choices. Okay. There's also, there, we also take into account um, siblings, so there's priority to put siblings in the same schools, um, and we define siblings as um, children who live under the same roof. Right, as we know that there are guardian situations, and so we want to ensure that we create every opportunity to make it as um, holistic for families as possible and to make it easy, too. Right, so um, the equivalency waiver, that's with the state, because all the questions so far is if it was approved. What if it's not approved? Does the district has a plan B in place for that? Yeah, um, great question. And unfortunately, if it's not approved, we're still in the same fiscal crisis. We're still gonna have to lay off teachers. It just means that, that um, we will have to lay off teachers only, not, not considering quality. And the impact that that will have is that we will retain more ineffective and partially effective teachers and we will have to let go of highly effective teachers and effective teachers. To us, that's just a really catastrophic impact on our students and their future. So. Okay, so you mentioned that two Cedar Street was moving to notificational, because I know there's been talk in the hallways about the superintendent moving to the um, student center. That, I mean, so no, entirely, yes. That means the entire central office, um, all staff, all departments would be moved together uh, not just one department here or one department there. Um, it would be an entire central office move and we would vacate the lease here, that two-seater. Correct, there would also be schools there and the desire is also for our work to be closer to our students. And the idea of moving our central office into a building that houses some of our programs and has some of our students allows us to really be able to interact directly with the students we're serving every day. And uh, so as we look at our options versus you know, walking and taking on another lease and being farther away from some of our programs and schools, we wanna be closer to them. Um, so can, can you just clarify, um, she made a point earlier about her son being in, in a private school um, and, apply, and doing the one org application. That's been a point of contention at a lot of schools. They're confused, there's some confusion as to whether or not they automatically have to take that seat So can, be, because they get, accept, you know, they get their first or second choice. Can you just offer a little bit of clarification around that, please, in terms of, you know, in terms of that action? Sure, so the, after the application process is closed, the end of this week, a matching process has begun. And so our expectation that by the middle of April, if not sooner, letters will go home to families. Um, so that they'll have plenty of time before the end of the school year to make a determination about whether they accept the matches that they've been given. Um, and then obviously there'll be an appeal process that will be filed as well for families that feel like maybe something was not, uh, was not done properly. The, the idea is choice, right? We wanna give parents as much choice as possible. They can choose to stay where they are or they could choose to take a different you know, school seat, but it's still their choice. Um, and so they will be the decider. Mm -hmm. um, going off of that, going off of that, if, um, so say they get placed in a location and then the parent or whatever decides that I don't want that, um, I don't want my student there, are the, is there like a wait list or something for people who um, kind of come out um, to fill that seat? So is it, you're, you're saying, so if someone gets a match, they choose to, let's say, go to a different school outside of Newark Public Schools, and that seat is vacated, then the, the next person, if it's still an open during open enrollment, then yes, the next person or, or student who, and the algorithm is next, would, would get that seat. That's my understanding. Yeah, it would be backfilled, correct. So that it wouldn't just be left empty, in other words, okay? So yes. My question is, if we're talking over three years, uh, declining enrollment, 
and laying off teachers, how does that affect central office staff? Will there be a reduction in staff for central office as well? That's a good question. Last summer, as you know, we, we, we did do um, a layoff last summer of central office staff. Um, and we have actually waited to touch schools because we know how important it is to have our schools fully staffed. Um, and now the situation has changed, right, considerably um, with the continued decline in enrollment and the continued fiscal crisis, which means that we will also have to look at central staff um, this spring. Um, I have two questions that are sort of related. One is in the schools that are closing that where there may, well, I guess in the schools that are closing, if the parents do not complete the one Newark enrolls application, what will happen to them? If they don't complete the application, if you're, for example, if you're a student who's at Newton, um, then the scenario is it's going to become a default. It'll become a default scenario to a geographic preference um, for those families. Um, that is a con that's a scenario we want to avoid at all costs. I understand that. But I was just also, being but <laughs> it's also it's also important to note Hawthorne is uh, is different in that sense. Because Brick is not a charter school, and again, one of the reasons this was an attractive model to us was to create some more diversity in the area. Families technically in PK4 to third grade at Hawthorne now, they don't have to do anything. They will default to that program unless they choose out of, out of that program. Uh, so that's an important point to note as well. But the students at Alexander, Bergaw, because those are charter launches, the law requires that they need to complete the application. And are they guaranteed a spot in those schools? Those two, yes. But they are still guaranteed a spot yeah, in those schools. Um, and the if people don't, and I'm just because I've been working at Newton trying to get parents to fill yeah. the applications. I know there's some rumors. Yes. Right, right, right. Um, but if they don't, when will they be told where they're placed? If all for some of, reason, my understanding, all the placements will happen in the middle of April. Okay. Um, and, and, and I appreciate and thank you for your service I, at Newton. Um, I think over the last 24 or 48 hours, we've started to make some progress and uncover some of right. the reasons people have hesitant. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just the, the reason for doing this session again is to continue to engage with the community to get the message out about what families' the true options are. Um, so thank you for that. The, the slide brings to, to mind um, a point that you made earlier, and I wanted to find out where to use the term, clarify for myself. The, when you say that the enrollments are going up, we're talking about the charter school enrollments that are going up, but the overall enrollment in Newark Public School as a portfolio of schools uh, continues to be whatever it is, the 30,000, 40,000, whatever it is, right? Declining to, to the 37,000 presently going down. No, I mean, in, in, in terms of the city of Newark, all of the students in the city of Newark. Has stabilized. That's stabilized. It's important to note, over the last two years, the demographic in terms of um, families and, and the number of students served throughout the city has stabilized, which for me, I'm so, I don't want to steal your question. Why don't you ask your question before I answer? <laughs> uh, that leads to the, to the next question, which is, uh, as per the decision for the opening of charters being made at, at, at the state level, the governor you know, authorizes which charters are going to be open. Um, being that Newark doesn't have any control over that, the scenario being that the schools are opening in Newark regardless of whether uh, NPS wants them to or not. If, if I'm correct in my, my understanding, uh, let's say the Hawthorne model, actually the, the Alexander and the Hawthorne model are areas where you can, I guess, mitigate the opening of these extra schools without having to incur uh, what the cost would be if those schools opened up in other areas. Yes, let me cl clarify, and then you can verify whether or not we're on the same page, if that would be OK. I can restate what I think your question was. Sure. So these are not extra. Um, it's important to note these aren't extra seats or extra charter schools. We haven't we haven't uh, worked with these charters to expand their growth plans. Mm -hmm. These are we're accommodating what's already been approved. Mm -hmm. um, your comment about the state is is extremely um, 
important because what you've noticed over the last two to three years is the state has slowed down significantly or become more rigorous in the approval process. So the charters, in terms of new operators coming online in the city, that hasn't been something that's happening. And so more reason for optimism on our end that through these very, very difficult and painful decisions we're making today, that we will truly achieve a stabilizing effect. The reason, the rationale to lead through these challenging times is to get to the other end, where we can truly stabilize both enrollment, staff, leadership, and resources throughout the district and begin to make the investments that we would have liked to have been made 15, 20 years ago back into the community. And so we think those are some key data points that you raise that give optimism that we're, we're on the right track to achieving that. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you so much for your time and for coming out. If you have other questions, please don't hesitate um, to reach out. Uh, if you know that there are other families or parents that have questions, please 